Okay, so start a new lecture. This one is called Histology. Okay, what is histology? Study of tissue. Study of tissue. Bryce, don't judge me. I feel like you're judging me. I'm judging you too. You might feel a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so study of tissue. Uh, question number one on the exam tonight dealt with macro and micro. This is an example of macro or micro anatomy. Mac micro. Micro. Yep. So what that means is we're going to use microscopes and devices that will aid our eyes to observe what's going on at the level of the tissue. Now, this term here, what exactly is a tissue? If we're going to study tissue, it would be nice if we knew what tissue was. Okay, so tissue. When we look at human anatomy, there are four types of tissue. By definition, a tissue is going to be a similar type of cell. This is, uh, yeah, look how far the pen is off. I'm going to take a brief. Let's see how fast I can do that. I had to do this last week, didn't I? Yeah. Two weeks ago. Yeah, or two weeks ago. So why do you join your fingers here? Because, well, if I try to tap it, I'm just not that accurate, and it actually registers when you take your finger off. So this way I can get it really, really accurate. See if I, well, that one was actually pretty good. But most of the time, I'm, I'm getting off. Go away. <laughs> there we go. No, seriously, leave. <laughs> All right, so similar type of cell and surrounding substances. We will refer to as the matrix. Also, could be referred to as the interstitial fluid, the tissue fluid, the ground substance, the extracellular fluid, the extracellular matrix. All of those mean exactly the same thing. Okay, so it's similar types of cells and their surrounding substance. So, if we ever have anything that has Similar functioning cells and are surrounded by extracellular fluid, it will be a tissue. So bone cells within a ground substance is a tissue. Nervous system cells within the extracellular matrix is a tissue. Blood is also a tissue because it's blood cells surrounded by extracellular fluid. Now, yeah, there's a lot more extracellular fluid to make it more fluid or liquid, but it's still classified as a tissue. Uh, in addition to that classic definition of a tissue, tissues also arise from similar embryonic cells. Okay, so what I mean by that is the cells that we find in nervous tissue, which are going to include things like neuron and glia, and uh, our microglia and blastoma cells are all going to come from the same embryonic origin. So we're going to have primordial embryonic cells that eventually will become the nervous tissue cells. All right, there are four types of tissue that we find in human anatomy. And those four types you can actually see them listed here. be epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue.
And as we go through this process of histology and anatomy and physiology, we're going to talk about specific types of each of these different types of tissue. Obviously, muscle tissue is going to include things like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Uh, nervous tissue is going to include things like the neurons and the microglia. Connective tissue is going to include things like bones, but also blood as well is considered a uh, connective tissue. And then epithelial tissues are typically what line organs or openings or lumen of other, of other organs. By the way, there is a hierarchy here. We've talked about the hierarchical order of biology. We go from cells to tissues to organs to organ systems to organisms. Okay, So we've talked about cells already. Now we take different types of cells and put them together in that extracellular fluid, and we get a type of tissue. And then we're going to take different types of tissues, put them together to form organs. Okay, So I may have in the heart muscle tissue and connective tissue and epithelial tissue, those three different types of tissue to make up the organ called the heart. Now the matrix, this term that we use, the matrix, it's going to be a fibrous protein containing water or watery gel. Okay? So the extracellular matrix, extracellular fluid, tissue fluid, ground substance, whatever the term that we're going to use, we're going to find that it's basically a solution that bathes the cells, and then there's also going to be these fibrous proteins that help structure the Tissue. Watery. Now, in all reality, extracellular matrix is going to be the correct term to use, although it's synonymous for most people with extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid, ground substance, all these other terms. What really is going on here? is the watery gel, the aqueous environment that we find in extra, as a component of the extracellular matrix is properly referred to as the extracellular fluid. So in all reality, extracellular matrix and extracellular fluid are actually not synonymous. Extracellular fluid is a component of the extracellular matrix. So extracellular fluid, most frequently referred to as the ECF, and this would be, if we're going to be real sticklers about it, the best place to use the terms tissue fluid, interstitial fluid, or ground substance to describe an extracellular fluid. Now, this ECF is going to vary in both volume and composition across a variety of different types of tissue. So in bone and cartilage, this extracellular fluid becomes almost thick or viscous and sort of rubbery, whereas in blood, it's much more water-like. It's much more fluid. All right, I want to start out with development of tissues. And really, when we talk about development, we're talking about embryogenesis and the biological process of embryogenesis, which starts at conception. At conception, in humans, we get one cell that's going to contain 46 chromosomes. And it could be plus or minus one. It could be 47 for individual Down syndrome, 45 for, for some individuals with some other types of conditions. But will suffice to say normal physiological um, starting point is going to be cell, one cell, 46 chromosomes. 23 from mom, 23 from dad. We have to develop that one cell into more cells. And these more cells that have to be developed are going to have a variety of different functions as they progress from conception towards adulthood. So from that one cell, we need to get muscle tissue. 
skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. We need to get the muscle uh, or the uh, tissue that makes up uh, the vascular wall of the, cir of the circulatory system, that makes up the nervous tissue that we find in the brain and the spinal cord, that makes up uh, the cavity of your the, the tissue surrounding the oral cavity. We got to make all of that tissue, all of those different types of cells, from that single one cell. So this single one cell has to have the blueprints already built in for all of the other types of cells. What are you laughing at? <laughs> the weirdest little girl I know. It's like 17 at night and I'm learning about, I don't even know. Just it's 17 at night and you're learning about conception. And <laughs> Okay, so from that single cell, we go through a series of cell cycles, and we begin to add additional cells. And by about the fourth day, we have over 36 different cells that have been developed. So we're going to take three layers, or we're going to begin to develop three different layers of tissue. And those three different layers of tissue, if you begin to look at the embryo that's developing, We're going to have the ectoderm, which is going to be an outer layer of tissue in the embryo. And this ectoderm is actually going to give rise to the epidermis and the nervous tissue. We are also going to have an inner layer of tissue that's sort of protected from the uterine environment. And this is referred to as the endoderm. So this is our inner layer. And that inner layer is going to have to give rise to tissues like the digestive system and the respiratory tract. And then right smack dab in the middle, in between the endo and the ectoderms, we're going to have the mesoderm. And this mesoderm, this middle layer of tissue, eventually becomes a primordial embryonic tissue that's known as, that, known as the mesenchyme. And the mesenchyme is going to be responsible for the production of muscle, bone, and blood. In all reality, as we develop these three different layers, the cell that you first get Again, it divides, and it forms two daughter cells, and then we form four daughter cells, and then we form eight daughter cells, and then we get 16 daughter cells that form, and we're developing all these additional cells. And what really begins to happen is we begin to get cells that are in different layers, and they have different exposures or rate of exposure to the uterine environment. Now, that different exposure rate, so we have some cells that are on the inside, and we have some cells that are on the outside. The cells that are on the outside, they get exposed to higher rates of oxygen and glucose and CO2 uptake and uh, waste removal. Whereas these cells here that are protected from the uterine environment, they have a different milieu of chemicals they're exposed to. Lower rates of oxygen and glucose. Higher rates of CO2 maintained inside of the tissue. Those are all environmental stimuli. Remember that whenever we have environmental stimuli, we get different uh, rates and levels of gene expression and different genes that are being expressed. And so it's that differential rate of exposure between these initial layers that then begins to allow the development of these other layers of tissue that are going to continue to work their way towards mature tissues that we would find in adults. That's a really abbreviated look at embryogenesis. I mean, you probably can take a whole class on embryogenesis and still only know a very small part of what actually happens from the point of conception until, until birth. Yeah, Paige. Okay, so you say the mesenchyme comes the mesenchyme and then the air is the muscle, bone, and blood. The mesenchyme is eventually going to become muscle, okay, blood, and bone. All right, so 
eventually we're going to go through this whole process, you know, the first 38 weeks of your life from conception until birth. You go through this process of development and tissues form, and you get new functions, and you get all this great stuff. And we can then classify all of the tissues that are present in the adult into those four different types of tissue. Okay? And we can go through a process of working with tissue so that we can observe tissue to learn about the microanatomy. Now, you can actually go over pages 145 and 146, and it's going to talk a little bit more about interpreting tissue sections. But I want to talk just real briefly, take about a minute or two to talk about how we generate tissue sections and, and a little bit about interpretation. Okay? So a tissue section, and you've seen these now, right? You go and you pull out a slide, and that slide's going to have a little little piece of material in there, you're going to put it under the microscope, and you can dial the microscope in, and you're going to be able to see a lot of detail. Okay? But really what you're looking at is you're looking at a very small sliver of that tissue. So if I take, um, let's say I have, oh, that's terrible. Let's try that again. Okay, so let's say I take out all the muscle. So there's a muscle. Maybe it's the gastroc muscle of a mouse, and I'm really interested in what's going on at the histological level. What I do is I wrap up that sample. I put it into this compound. It's called optimal cutting compound. And I basically, it's a gel that you just squirt on that bad boy, on that tissue that you just, um, that you just dissected out of a human or a mouse or whatever. And then you put it into uh, a solution that's going to freeze it. And it's basically a solution that sits right around. It's liquid at 100, minus 120 degrees centigrade. We usually take a liquid nitrogen, a bath of liquid nitrogen, which is already really cold. It's about minus 8 degrees centigrade, and put in um, uh, isopropanol, uh, which is a liquid that drops down to about minus 120 degrees centigrade. Then we take that tissue sample that we've just wrapped up in gel and we dip it in and instantly it freezes. It snap freezes to minus 120 degrees centigrade faster than I can snap my fingers. And what happens is the tissue gets pulled down to that temperature so quickly that water doesn't have time to expand. Normally water expands when it freezes, right? And that's why ice floats in, in liquid water is because the water as it's going down to that frozen state actually expands and so it becomes more buoyant in water. But if I take it down to minus 120 degrees instantly like that, it doesn't have time for water to expand. And that's really advantageous because when water expands in a small little packet like a cell, it would cause the cell to burst. By preserving it this way, I can actually freeze it in its state, the last state that it had in, uh, in existence. Okay, So I get this little tiny ice cube, basically, and then I take it over to this big machine, and we actually have one sitting in the lab just down the hall, and it's a big machine that stands about this big. It's actually about as big as this podium. Sort of looks like this podium as well. And what it is is it's a knife. One of the weirdest knives you've probably ever heard about. But it's refrigerated, so you open up this little chamber in there, and there's lights and everything that you can turn on, so you can open this thing up and you keep it right around minus 20 degrees. So it's basically like a, a freezer. And on that freezer, or in that freezer, there is a pedestal or platform where you put your sample. So you put this sample on there, and then on the outside you have a dot. It's kind of like... Um, I don't know, it kind of looks like efficient, to be perfectly honest. But every time you rotate that, um, every time you rotate that dial, it causes that pedestal to move. And it moves in the vertical direction, and it increases, and it moves in the, in the horizontal direction towards the blade by about 5 nanometers for a micro. And so every time you, every time you rotate the crank, it scrapes it against that knife and moves it just a little bit closer, and then you get a really small, thin section of that tissue. Then you take a microscope slide, and you just literally have to touch that section to the, little, to the microscope slide. That little section will instantly adhere to the microscope slide, 
and throw on a cover slip. And <coughs> ironically, the uh, cover slip is going to be sealed on and actually gets glued in place over that uh, over that uh, tissue sample so that it preserves. And you know what the glue is, the, the best type of glue to use? Clear nail polish. So you put a little bead of clear nail polish on there, drop your cover slip on, and that's what you guys are observing in the in the lab when you look at histological sections. Now, this tissue here, and what you're going to read about in the book on pages 146 and 147, I think I said, or 145 and 146, 145 and 146, is what you actually would be looking at to understand a histological section. So I could take this, this little block here, and I could put it on that pedestal, so that I can cut across this face. And that would be down the length of the muscle, and I'm going to call that a LS, or a longitudinal section. Or I can take and I can rotate that block, and I can cut it along that section. And so I'm going across the tissue, and I'm going to call that a cross section. Okay? So you probably noticed when you're looking at those slides during lab, that some of them were marked as LS and some of them were marked as XS. LS were longitudinal sections, XS were cross sections, and it talked about how we were actually making the section through the tissue. So if I had, <clears throat> let's say, a piece of um, the digestive system, maybe it's the duodenum of the small intestine, I could cut it so I could see all of this here. So I could see that longitudinal section, and it would sort of look <clears throat> something like that. It would just be a small little piece. Most of it would be open, and there would just be um, kind of the outer edges. Or I could take it, and I could rotate it 90 degrees, and I could look at the tissue wall in this direction and see kind of if I was looking down that tube. And that would be a cross section. Okay. What time is it? 27. Hopefully a lot of that makes a little more sense. Let's talk about epithelial tissue. This is one of our uh, one of our four types of tissue. Okay, so I got a picture here of epithelial tissue, and actually, what you're seeing now is that epithelial tissue is a very diverse uh, group of tissues. And really, uh, a sort of definition of epithelial tissue is epithelial tissue comes in sheets, and it's going to be a sheet of adhered cells, a sheet of adhered cells. Now, one of the things about epithelial tissue is epithelial tissue is packed really, really tight. The individual cells are packed really tight together. And because they're packed really tight together, there's not a lot of extra room for other stuff, including capillaries. So epithelial tissue is actually very avascular, meaning there's not a lot of circula circulatory supply in um, these tissues. So there's very little room for vessels. Now, that's not really all that great because we still want to be able to maintain that tissue, which means we need to have uh, access to the circulatory system. The way that we're going to maintain these avascular epithelial tissues is that the tissue is actually going to set on top of a more vascular <coughs> tissue. Okay, so we set on top of a more vascular tissue. Okay, uh, what you can see in this picture here, regardless of the type of epithelial tissue that you're looking at, you have a top side and you have a bottom side. So epithelial tissue is going to come with a top side and a bottom side. Before I move on, let me step back one second here. Uh, the vascular tissue 
is going to be referred to as the basement membrane. And it's basically kind of like epithelial tissue sitting on top of connective tissue that's more vascular. Okay, so now back to the top surface and the bottom surface. The basal surface is going to be on the bottom or closest to the basement membrane. So the basal surface of an epithelial tissue is near the basement membrane. Now you observed a number of epithelial tissues in that histo histology lab that you've already completed. And you actually have sort of already seen similar sections to what you can see here. There is one side that was real wavy usually, and that was going to be the other uh, other side of the tissue. The basement membrane was what was everything else, all of the connective tissue and everything else you can see uh, in that in those samples. All right, the side of tissue here on top or that faces usually it faces into an organ or into a lumen, which is an opening within an organ. And those surfaces are referred to as the apical surface. So this is going to be near the lumen. So we would find epithelial tissue lining the digestive system. And the apical surface would be what faces into the stomach or into the duodenum of the small intestine. But also, you actually can see apical surface of an epithelial cell every time you look at your skin. So we'll also find the apical surface near the environment as well. Now, epithelial tissues are actually going to be further divided or broken up into three categories. And really these categories are going to help to distinguish the different types of epithelium. And you're going to recognize these three categories because you've already really dealt with these three categories when you were looking at these histological sections in lab. They're going to be simple. And that category of epithelium, such as the simple columnar, cuboidal, or squamous cell samples that we have here, the simple just simply means that all of the cells are directly on the basement membrane. And so it's simple. It's just a single layer of cells. Because everybody has this and they have to. Everybody good? Okay, so simple is just that single layer. Next, we have what's known as pseudo-stratified. Now, a pseudo-stratified epithelial tissue is actually going to be still just one layer. However, there's going to be some cells... that are embedded. And so the apical surface of some of the cells don't actually extend all the way to the top of the tissue. So some of the cells appear to be embedded in other cells. So here's an example of a pseudo-stratified columnar tissue. And what you can see is this first cell here, it has a basal surface and an apical surface on either side of the tissue. But then I have a couple cells that are just kind of stuck in there. So pseudo-stratified, this really means fake, <coughs> fake layer. And it gives the impression, even though it's still just one layer, it gives the impression that it actually has multiple layers. So it's fake layer, pseudo-stratified. Last, we have stratified, and these are going to be true cell layers. So the cells are layered, uh, or we could say they come in strata. Uh, S, ah, 
STR strata. S-T-R-A-T-A. -T -A. Okay, so maybe you're a geology buff and you know that sedimentary rock comes in strata, and that's just simply a couple layers. So you can see here I got a stratified squamous where I have layers of squamous cells, and we could go through and count one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers, five layers, six layers or stratified cuboidal cells. Now, notice that we're using these three different categories of epithelium in the name to describe what we're actually observing. But there are actually going to be some additional pieces of information that come and help to name these different layers of epithelia. And really, it's coming from the type of cell that is going to be present. And the three options that you have are squamous, which really just refers to something that looks more like a fried egg or a scale. And actually, that's really what squamous means, is, is scale. Um, Bryce, do you remember the name of uh, snakes and lizards? Squamata? Is that right? And that just refers to the fact that they have scales. I'm not an uh, organismal biologist, so I don't remember all of those terms. So squamous, cuboidal, with, this one's real easy. It looks like a cube, right? And then columnar. which is a, more of an elongating cube, more of a column. So, someone name this tissue for me. Simple cuboidal. Now name the tissue. Stratified cuboidal. Now we have one last designator. And that term is keratinized. And that's what you look at here on your skin. You all are aware that the top layer of your skin is dead. These are dead cells that are exfoliating off. So you're leaving parts of you all over the place. And keratinized is the term that, use, that we use to describe that layer of dead cells. And they're affixed over living cells. Yeah. So here, the picture that I've just drawn, those are dead. And these are living. So name that tissue. Okay, it is a stratified squamous, but it has keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So why a monkey? I just can't find a picture of a human. So this poor chimpanzee. Well, maybe it's in a bonobo. I know you're not. Someone's hiccuping, and now I'm like totally just lost what I was. Let's just look at this picture of a monkey. <laughs> so what you can see is places like the nasal cavity and down the esophagus or uh, the trachea. You're going to have pseudostratified cells, and they're also going to be ciliated. We're going to have uh, stratified squamous cells that we find at the base of the larynx. In the digestive system, you're going to have a layer of simple cuboidal cells surrounding the, the, the lumen of the 
digestive system. Simple squamous cells making up the alveoli and portions of the lung. So you can see that these different types of tissues end up all over the place, incorporated into a variety of different types of organs. Yes? Okay, so it would be like, depending on where the bodies are, no, really what I'm showing here is that the epithelium, it's not like, like the nervous tissue you're going to find in your brain and your spinal column, right? Epithelial tissue is going to show up all over the place. We're going to have epithelial tissue that makes up the brain because there's vasculature in the brain. And you're going to line all of those vessels in the, in the vasculature with squamous epithelium. So it shows up in all different types of organs. So we can take out the heart. That's a terrible heart. Holy cow. Let's try that again. All right, marginally better. And I got the chambers inside of the heart, right? And all of this tissue here lining the chamber of the heart is that the filial tissue? Okay, yes, I'm asking, but... But as I move out, I'm going to run into muscle tissue, but then I'm also going to run into another layer of that the filial tissue surrounding the whole heart. Does it depend on where it is, the top? Does it depend on where it is, the bottom? Or the you know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, so you're maybe, maybe this was sort of your question as well, is... Mm -hmm. If I'm out here, is it pseudo-stratified? And if I'm in here, is it simple cuboidal? No, is that not really important? No, I like, they, some of them look bigger than others. So, like, is that actually for real? Or do you see what I'm saying? I have no clue what you're saying now. <laughs> Just let it go. It's not a big deal. It probably doesn't matter in this game of things. <laughs> do you see anything else? Like, is there anything else? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
extracellular fluid as well. Now the fibers that are present in fibrous connective tissue, there's actually going to be three types that can be present in different fibrous tissues. So three types of fibers can be present. And those three types of fibers are going to be either collagen fibers, reticular fibers, or elastic fibers. So in a fibrous connected tissue, I should expect to find cells, and then one of these three different types of fibers, collagen, reticular, or elastic fibers, and then the ground substance. Now, the thing about the ground substance or the extracellular matrix is this is going to basically be the substance that these fibers are going to be incorporated into. Now, the ground substance, it can actually come in either a low abundance or a high abundance of fibers. Now, when we have low abundance, so this is a low abundance of fibers, we refer to that connective tissue as a loose connective tissue. And there are two types of loose connective tissues. One of those is areolar. Uh-oh. TMC will delay opening until 12 noon tomorrow. The dining hall will serve brunch from 10 to 2 and dinner from 4 to 6. I expected that was coming. <laughs> what, what, what exam do you have on Wednesday? Two quizzes. <laughs> well, since you guys don't have to be here until noon tomorrow, let's just go until 10. <laughs> That's not until, oh, that's Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I'm dumb. Let me put that together. All right, so areolar tissue is going to be filler uh, in the space between tissues. Okay. Areolar tissue, you're going to have cells. In this case, they're fibrocytes. Basically means fiber cells. And we're going to have collagen. And that collagen is going to be, that's what you can see, all of this stuff in there. These are collagen fibers surrounding those fibrocytes. And we're going to find this areolar tissue. It's, tissue. it's a loose tissue because of the low concentration of those fibers. We're going to find it sort of in the spaces between tissues. It's sort of mm -hmm. kind of like transitional tissue from muscle to uh, nervous tissue, whatever. Then we have reticular tissue. We're going to find this in places like the liver and the spleen. And reticular tissue, it's again, it's still a loose tissue, low abundance of fibers. Uh, you can see that the fibers are a little bit more disorganized. The little white spaces in there are the cells. So this would be liver and spleen. Now, whenever we have high abundance of fibers, and you're going to see in these next couple of pictures that this is going to be quite a bit different in appearance. So our high abundance of fibers, we're going to refer to these as dense fibrous tissues. Now, in dense fibrous tissues, we're going to pack in the fibers. But they can get organized in one of two ways either in a very regular pattern or in more like a bowl of spaghetti, which would be irregular. When they are in a regular pattern, typically we're going to find these located in places where that regular pattern is going to help the function of the organ. Let's think in terms of tendons and ligaments here. Things that are going to pull in one direction, a tendon pulls on the bone in one direction. 
Okay, so tendons and ligaments. So you can see here that we have uh, collagen is going to be our uh, is going to be our fiber that's present in the extracellular matrix, and then there's going to be the fibrocytes, which are these little bulges, not the whole thing here. It's just these little bulges that we find, and the collagen runs in a very organized pattern. So they're all basically very parallel or very regular. When the pattern is more irregular, this is, anyone know what a rip stop is? How many of you own a tent? Or a, or a rain jacket? You ever seen rip stop? That's the pattern that looks like this inside of, and so if you cut the fabric here, you can stop it from expanding all the way over the whole, your whole raincoat or your whole rain fly on your tent. This is a very irregular organization. It's not all organized like this. It's got that more irregular pattern, right? Okay, so irregular, just to kind of keep this in your mind, is when we're going to have things that we want to prevent from having the ability to create big, long tears, like your skin. So we're going to find this in the dermis of the skin. And so you can see that the pattern here, it's not all kind of in one direction. You have some of it that runs this way. This stuff here is actually the, the, the fibers coming out towards you. So this is a longitudinal a section or a longitudinal example. And then this would be more of the cross section. So that fi those fibers are kind of interweaving in a variety of different directions. <clears throat> 